Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kate Brand, and I'm a director of data science in the data unit at the CMA. I'm one of the authors of our paper and will be leading our analyzing algorithms program. At the CMA, our mission is to make markets work well. We're all consumers of goods and services and our living standards are affected by how fair and efficient firms are in delivering them. These markets touch on many areas of our lives, which makes competition policy and consumer protection a wide reaching tool to address many harms and issues. In our view, they are underexplored and underused tools to address harms caused by businesses' misuse of algorithms. That brings me to the purpose of our call for information and the event today. We want to start a conversation between technologists and competition and consumer protection communities. As more and more areas of our lives are affected by algorithmic systems, we have a responsibility and indeed an opportunity to properly investigate them and to make sure that regulation is effective so that algorithmic systems are not harmful. We would like to raise awareness among the technology community about the type of issues that we could help with and to encourage interest from people with relevant skills or knowledge about harmful practices that we should address. My goal in the remainder of my time is to illustrate some of the potential harms from misuse of algorithms that we have looked at in the paper. Those that I'm covering today will be highlighted on the slides. As Stefan mentioned, although some of the harms are relatively well known, others are far less explored and we think they need more attention. I'm going to begin by discussing direct harms to consumers. In the paper, we identify four broad categories of consumer harm. Personalised pricing, more general non-price personalisation, algorithmic discrimination and unfair ranking and design. In this section, I'm going to discuss personalised pricing in more detail, but then pick out a particular practice and example for each of the other three. The first potential harm regards personalised pricing. So what is it? This is where different prices are shown to different consumers, either directly by showing them different advertised prices or in less direct ways that achieve the same effect. So why might personalised pricing be a problem? Well, it isn't necessarily a problem in itself. People can always go and shop somewhere else if they don't like it right. But it can be a, a problem where there is a lack of transparency or where there is a lack of alternative providers, which is more likely where there is insufficient competition. And of course, the potential to do this more successfully is growing because algorithms can be used to exploit the vast amounts of data that now exist on individual consumers' online behaviours and better determine what they might be willing to pay for something. So do we think that this is actually happening? Well, the most recent evidence is that advertised prices are not widely personalised. Although I should caveat this to say um, that the studies we're aware of are a couple of years out of date now, and these things can change quite quickly. When these practices have been uncovered in the past, there has been quite a fierce consumer backlash, which suggests that companies are quite wary of doing this in a way that consumers can actually pick up on. However, we think there are a number of other more subtle practices happening that are likely to have the same effect. One of these practices is where companies send discounts or promotional offers to more price sensitive customers, but don't send them to those they think would be willing to pay the higher prices. This, of course, has the same effect as using personalised advertised prices, but less customers get upset with them. Another practice is where companies can personalise prices in services that are difficult to compare to each other. A good example here is in ride sharing platforms like Uber, where a customer is set a price based on multiple factors like length of journey or time of day, so that it's hard to know if your personal information is being used to, pers to personalise that price to you. Multiple press reports have speculated on whether ride sharing services like Uber personalised prices based on things like your payment method or even on if your phone is about to run out of charge. And finally, personalised ranking is also quite prevalent and this can be used, for example, to make more expensive options more prominent to consumers who are less price sensitive. These practices can effectively achieve personalised pricing, but they are less well known and more difficult to detect. 
we think it would be helpful to continue to develop better and scalable techniques to detect and measure personalised pricing. Of course, personalisation can be applied far more widely than to just prices. In the paper, we discuss two important types of non-price personalisation shown here. As a reminder, the practices that I'm going to talk about today are highlighted in blue. So I'm going to discuss a type of non-price personalisation, which we've called manipulating user journeys. This is where a customer's journey through a website or an app is personalised to steer users through a website or app in a way that benefits the firm, but that may harm the consumer. An example that we are aware of is the practice of manipulating app ratings and reviews. This is where an app developer can use algorithmic systems to personalise a customer's journey through parts of the app to achieve better overall ratings and reviews on an app store. So as I've just discussed for personalised pricing, firms now have access to large amounts of data on their customers' characteristics and online interaction history, and they can use this data to predict things about them. In this case, they can predict how likely a customer is to give a positive rating. They could then, for example, send a pop-up message to those users more likely to give a positive rating and at the most opportune time, of course, and provide a useful link to rate their app. But then they could simply not ask those users that they think would give them a lower rating. The overall effect is higher ratings and better reviews for the business. We suspect that this practice has led to ratings inflation and less useful and informative ratings for consumers generally. Such practices also hurt consumers because they are less able to identify better quality apps and firms face weaker incentives to keep their apps high quality. Of course, this is only one example and you could imagine many other use cases where customer journeys are manipulated. We suspect it is becoming increasingly used in more sophisticated ways that consumers are totally unaware of. This is an area that we would be particularly interested in hearing about from others. Given its importance and scope for significant harm, we've pulled algorithmic discrimination out as a separate category. There is, of course, a huge literature on this, and it's well known in data science communities that discrimination can creep in in many ways unless the systems are carefully checked, quality assured, and often specifically designed to avoid discriminating against those with protected characteristics. In the paper, we focus on some particular examples to show where indirect discrimination of consumers can occur. One practice that can be particularly problematic is geographic targeting. This can often result in indirect discrimination because people with protected characteristics are unevenly distributed in where they live. As a result, even simple algorithmic systems could potentially result in indirect discrimination. For example, when Amazon expanded free same-day delivery for its prime service in 2016 in the US, it prioritised areas with high concentrations of prime members. However, the effect of this was that predominantly black neighbourhoods were excluded, even in some cases where every area surrounded those neighbourhoods were served. Traders should ensure that they have the right procedures to identify potential algorithmic discrimination in their systems. So I've already touched on how ranking of results or products can be personalised. Rankings can also be manipulated more universally for commercial advantage in a way that ultimately degrades the offering to consumers. For example, most consumers assume that when they search a hotel booking site, the site will return a list of options that are ranked based on the best rates available for them. But this is not necessarily the case. In 2019, our investigation into hotel booking sites found that some sites ranked search results based on factors including the amount of commission that the site had received from different hotels and that this was not disclosed to customers. We think this type of practice is unacceptable and may launch investigations if we find evidence of this. So I'll now move to discuss harms that primarily affect competition, which of course ultimately affects consumers. 
In the paper, we identify three broad categories of competition harms, exclusionary practices, algorithmic collusion, and ineffective platform oversight harms. Here, I'm going to discuss one of the main exclusionary practices, self-preferencing, and I'll also discuss algorithmic collusion. So first off, what are exclusionary practices? We define them as those in which algorithmic systems are used by dominant firms to prevent competitors from challenging their market position. An important example of this is of online platforms favouring their own products or services, something that we refer to as self-preferencing. And a well-known example of this is the European Commission case where they found that Google was positioning and displaying its own Google shopping service much more prominently in its general search results than those of rivals. And there are other high profile cases too. In the UK and EU, dominant firms have a special responsibility to ensure that their algorithmic systems do not harm competition. However, they can be technically challenging to investigate due to the lack of transparency of the algorithmic systems involved. I'm now going to move on to algorithmic collusion. The potential for this has been relatively well studied academically and also widely discussed among competition agencies. The general idea is that algorithms can facilitate collusion between different firms setting prices for goods or services and generally online. This might not sound like a serious harm, but it has the potential to raise prices for huge numbers of goods and undermine the fundamental way that competition works. Algorithms can reduce competition by facilitating collusion in three ways. They can be used to automatically detect and respond to price deviations by competitors, which could make explicit collusion between firms more stable, as there's less incentive for those involved to cheat or defect from the cartel. Firms could also use the same algorithmic system to set prices, for example, by using the same third party software through which they could exchange information, something that we refer to as hub and spoke model. There are also concerns that algorithms can learn to collude tacitly without firms explicitly communicating with each other. As shown by the literature on repeated gains, the algorithms can learn longer term strategies based on what their competitors are doing that can make the company higher overall profits which generally means higher than competitive prices for consumers. All these examples can lead to sustained higher prices. There have been a few enforcement cases by competition authorities in the last couple of years against firms that have used pricing algorithms to enforce explicit collusive agreements. However, there are very few empirical studies to understand real world impacts of the other two areas. On autonomous tacit collusion, although there have been papers to show that theoretically at least algorithms could learn to collude, there is very little empirical evidence to show whether they do in practice. We don't even have a good grasp of how many firms use the more sophisticated pricing algorithms that are clever enough to, be, to actually tacitly collude. There has been one interesting recent study though that is worth mentioning. This study estimated that German retail petrol stations who faced local competition significantly increased their margins after adopting algorithmic pricing, while those who didn't have comp competitors stayed the same. This is the first empirical evidence that we've seen suggesting that algorithms can learn over time to coordinate tacitly with competitors to achieve higher prices. We think this is an area where more empirical research is desperately needed to understand how much of an issue it is or could quickly become across wide parts of our economy so that policymakers and legislators can ensure that the law keeps pace with the evolving harms. So that was a whistle stop tour of some of the competition and consumer harms from algorithms that we've identified and discussed in our paper. We think these could all be potentially problematic, but we would like to know more about where others see problematic practices and think more work should be done to inform our ongoing analysing algorithms programme. So please get in touch with us. My email is on this slide or respond more formally to our call for information. 
Thank you for listening, and I'll now hand back over to Stefan to introduce our panel members.